The Ben Heck Show is brought to you by Element 14, the electronic design community and online store built for engineers and hobbyists alike. Join now and browse the store at element14.com. Amazing builds, exclusive mods, cutting edge ideas, electronics, engineering, and more. Every week on Element 14's The Ben Heck Show. Hello and welcome back to The Ben Heck Show. In today's episode, we're going to interview famous people from the maker movement. Our first batch of interviews were filmed at the World Maker Fair in New York 2013. These include Brie Pettis of MakerBot, Jerry Ellsworth of Technical Illusions, Joe Prusa, the father of RepRap, and Eben Upton, the face of the Raspberry Pi. Let's get started. All right, we're here with Eben Upton, the creator of the Raspberry Pi. Is that correct? That's, uh, I'm one of the creators. One of the, the creators. Pie. You're kind of the, uh, the uh, how do we put this, the face of the Raspberry Pi? Yeah, I guess so. Sort of. Uh, right. Why did you call it the Raspberry Pi? Was it just a name? <laughs> And the idea was to have, so Raspberry is just fruit named computer companies. There's an awful lot of fruit named computer companies. You know, guys like Apricot, um, uh, Acorn in the UK, that was technically a fruit. Oh, yeah. So there's a, there's a lot of these uh, a lot of these fruit named computer companies. In the UK, you know, blowing a raspberry is like, like that. Oh, yeah. So it's kind of a rude fruit. It's the rudest fruit. So the PI, the reason we picked P PI is because we thought that Greek letter, Pi, right. would make a really nice logo. And as you can see, we've not used that at all, right? You know, there's nothing else called Raspberry Pi. I that think there was fall. there were one or two days early in the launch where we'd actually, I think we may have managed to push Raspberry into second place. <laughs> yeah, you know, you look you look out here and make a fair, and it's just a vast, vast number of projects running on it. You know, we've got this big community. Obviously, we've got the Element 14 community. We've got the Raspberry Pi community. You know, we've got these uh, these places where people can go, to, go for help. You know, there's real value in having a lot of them out there. Because it means if you're having a problem, somebody else has probably had that problem before. And what I like is um, we're, we're, we want to make the uh, little Raspberry Pi uh, handheld gaming console. We did it on the show. Yeah. And what, what we, we were looking at it like, hey, you know, we can just get a PCB made. We know it would fit every Pi because the form factor is always the same. Yeah. Would it be possible maybe in the future to get a Pi without any of the headers? Maybe just like a micro HDMI and just basically none of the through hole populated parts? Yeah, so we get asked this a lot. I think uh, there's a lot of people who are using the Pi and putting up with the form factor. If you see what I mean, you know, they're, they're, they like, they love the Pi a little bit. And the, the form factor is great as a small computer for kids, but if you want to use it as an industrial embedded machine, none of these boards are, really have the right form factor. It's certainly something we're aware of. Well, maybe one way to do it is, you know, if you sold the Pi like that, it's a lot easier to desolder, it's a lot easier to solder those connectants in than to desolder them, especially with like a, you know, internal ground plane. That's what really is difficult, especially with Rojas, it's a lot more difficult. Yeah, you know, you've got a lot of copper in there, so there were just yeah. one, there were one or two connectors on there where you're really going to struggle. You'll get the signal pins down, but you're really going to struggle. So you're going to yeah. need a big poker of yeah. a soldering iron to get those ground pins down. Personally, what is your favorite project that you've seen done with your Pi? Well, I think the one that I mentioned in the talk here, the balloon, all the ballooning ones. I love anything to do with space. So, you know, the ballooning ones are a lot of fun. I love the ones that are to do with beer. So I really love, you know, those you know, brew pie. Um, like you control a brewery with, uh, with a pie. That's a lot of fun. There's a big crossover between people who like electronics and people who like beer. Hey, look who we found, Joe Prusa, the right. godfather of the RepRap. So RepRap is the basis for pretty much all printer design these days. Yeah, I would say so. I think it's a great design because, you know, you're not trying to synchronize the Z axes. You just have two motors. Yeah, you, you, you wouldn't believe how many haters I had. The, another motor was cheaper than the belt. Yes, or cheaper than the pain of trying to make the belt work. Yes, yes. People need to realize that the time they spend is worth more than the Components. Have you ever tried to build uh, the old South Mendels? Uh, where South where Mendels? there was a belt synchronizing yeah. it? No, I've never done that. It, it was a lot of pain. It's like just buy an extra $15 motor. It's so Now, is this a new model that you have? Uh, yes, this is kind of new, kind of old. I still, I'm still improving it, but a lot of people build it anyway. Yeah, it's called i3. It's uh, the same volume. It's roughly 40 by 40 by 40 centimeters. Wow. And it prints 20 by 20. 20 by 20 centimeters big object, so 8 inch cube. It's a uh, full stainless steel uh, nozzle. Uh, oh, really? There's no PTFE or anything like that inside. Oh, it's so awesome. And it's polished to mirror finish inside, so you don't have to have anything else. Uh, this is aluminum heatsink. It's all made from food safe stainless steel. Well, thank you for your time today. Uh, I thank you. I'm, I'm really glad I met you. 
We're here at Maker Fair with Bree from MakerBot. Hey. Good to see you again. Great to see you. Now, I ran into you a couple years ago at SAS on top of the roof. Remember, you had the MakerBot replicator <laughs> under your arm? Yeah. The first one I have to ask, what is the deal with the platform heating up and then the extruder? Well, is there a reason for that? It's because the platform, so on the repli original replicator, mm -hmm. the platform takes a long time to heat up and the extruder doesn't take nearly as long. So you know you guys have a lot of new products coming out, yes. um, and then right now it's the Replicator 2X is the newest thing you have? We've got the MakerBot Replicator 2, which is our most, I would say, for most people that's what you want to get. The Replicator 2X is a dual extrusion, ABS optimized one. Right. The Replicator 2 um, really is optimized for PLA, which is just my favorite material. Oh, why is that? It's really dimensionally stable, has very low shrinkage, and the, the colors you get out of it are just so gorgeous. Oh, I saw a really cool ruby red. The shrinkage is what causes the lifting sometimes because yeah. it kind of contracts upon itself. What's something that you would add if you could just do whatever you wanted? You know, one of the things I actually wanted to add, and it just was not feasible, was I thought it would be great to add a boom box somewhere to it so that it could not only, like, make things, but could be, like, Pumping the jams while you're doing it. I would never it. guess that would be your answer. <laughs> I think that the stuff that's going to happen in the medical space is just going to... I don't even think we know what's going to... What, we can't know yet what's going to happen. It's, it's still a It's still a huge frontier. Okay, here's my 3D printer pitch to you. Okay, what do you got? Okay, you know like in the developing countries, like water vessels and portable toilets are something yes. that could be very useful? So... You have a schooner, schooner, goes out the great garbage patch, scoop it up, recycle it on board into filament, and extrude it into things that can be used for humanitarian causes. What do you think? I'm, you know what, there's actually, I think it's a great idea. Um, I would say let's start with the humanitarian causes and just make the, make the filament and get the process going and then we can make the scooper later. All right, well that's all I need to ask you for. Very, thank you very much for your time. Yeah, it's, it's great. great to meet you again. Good to see you again. And, and, and look forward to Replicator 3. We are here at Maker Fair with Jerry Ellsworth. Hi guys. Of Technical Illusions. Yeah, my new company. Right. Tell us about your new company. Well, it's kind of a spin out from uh, Valve Software. I was working there and we developed some uh, augmented reality augmented reality tech that you really didn't want anymore. So we negotiated to get it out of the company and we're doing it ourselves. What is the difference between augmented reality and virtual reality? Well, augmented reality is that you can still see the real world around you. So you can put graphics into the world. And virtual reality is where you're cut off from the world entirely, like goggles that cover your eyes. So I was reading your Twitter, because of course I tweet stalk you and you were talking about the wonders of hot glue. I love hot glue. In the past, you had given me crap about hot glue. Have you changed your opinion? Well, after looking at our prototypes that have been to two maker fairs and like two other events and they're still running, hot glue encased the entire prototype and saved it. Just had got new prototypes and I accidentally dropped them off the, the desk and they broke into three pieces because they were this resin SLA print. Right. And I was like, oh. I'm just kind of wondering, where is your game content going to come from? I mean, this is kind of a custom thing, rather than a plug-in like Oculus Rift might have. Yeah, so well, we can do virtual reality type experiences. So the way our system works is we have two projectors on our glasses that project out to a retroreflective surface. Mm -hmm. and then you get a very immersive stereoscopic image that comes back. We have a head tracker that tracks your head position. So as you move your head side to side or you get in closer to the surface or move away, the graphics will change to be appropriate for... Does it use gyros and optical tracking? It's purely optical. It's absolute oh, nice. tracking. So One less part. Yeah. We might put a gyro in there just in case the optical loses sight of these LEDs that are embedded in the surface. Setting up a Kickstarter, which I know you're about to launch. Yeah. What has been like the biggest kind of surprise? Like, oh, I did not expect that to be a big issue. The biggest surprise to me was the psychology behind Kickstarter. For instance, one thing is you don't want the press to pick up on your story before um, you actually have money um, oh. on your Kickstarter. <clears throat> For instance, um, if press sends like thousands of people in and then there's no money sitting there, people don't have any faith in your project and they won't back it. Oh. So it kind of it taints your project and it goes forward through the entire month. So if, if you're like, hey babe, let's go on a date, and you pull up in a like a uh, Chevy Metro, you could be a millionaire, but it doesn't look like you are. I like Chevy Metros. I know, back 1986, carbureted 60 miles to the gallon. Yeah. Why can't we build cars like that now? <laughs> Get dev kits fast. Element 14, your dev kit HQ.
Our next two interviews were conducted over Skype. We're going to be talking to Chris Gamble of the Amp Hour podcast and Jeremy Bloom, an author who also designed the electronics in the MakerBot replicator. Let's say hello. My name is Chris Gamble. I'm a full-time electrical engineer, and I also do a podcast with Dave Jones of the EEV blog. Uh, we call it the Amp Hour. It's once a week. It's basically an outcropping of complaining about stuff and laughing about stuff. So, Do you feel that an audio podcast has advantages over a video blog? It's limiting in a couple ways. Like, if we want to show something off, we have to... We can't. We can't just get a hold of it up to the camera and be like, "Oh, well, this this trace here, that kind of thing." You have to but describe uh, it. <laughs> it's a little more uh, lifestyle, really. That's what it really comes down to. Is we don't we don't get to dig into the the technical side of things as much like you do on your show. Um, we have to basically we talk more about uh, the business side of electronics. We talk about we talk about the culture of the maker movement, that kind of thing. If you could interview anyone you want, is there anyone that you'd really love to interview? I mean, realistically, or someone that you've tried to get that you are, you know wish you could? Or one is the Waz, obviously Steve Wozniak. Oh, um, so he's a big one, and the other one actually, we'd love to get Horowitz and Hill on there. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, I've I've emailed Win Hill before, but to no avail. Those guys are pretty busy, so that's we're we'll keep working on it. We got some fun ones coming up though. Are you working on any cool projects at the moment that you'd like to talk about or tell us about? I'm working on a new thing actually, uh, right back there. Contextual Electronics actually, it's a. Uh, it's a program teaching people how to build, design and build electronics, like a 10 week course, and uh, using open source tools, so kind of keeping everything going on there. So teach people how to use KiCad. Um, but yeah, it's a 10 week course, video course, people actually building hardware alongside one another. What is the most exciting thing that you have seen in the maker movement recently? The thing that is exciting to me uh, about the maker movement is the accessibility aspect of it, because there's so much power in making something easier to grasp for, for people um, and then enabling them uh, to do what they've always wanted to do, right? So it might be, you know, cosplay, might, they might want to light up something with LEDs, they might want to build a 3D printer, they might want to, uh, you know, start a craft business, something something along those lines. But basically all these tools that are being developed on a continual basis are just, they're exploding. It feeds back into the actual industry side of things as well. Look at all the different, what are they called, plates for Raspberry Pi and the shields for Arduino and capes for the Bugo bone. I yes, mean, like, yes, that's right. Yep. People are building businesses off that. And that's, that's a really cool thing. I, I, I think I have more development boards than like, than like socks and underwear. <laughs> right. And none match either. <laughs> right. Right. All right. Well, thank you very much for your time. And, uh, Amp Hour podcast, and then of course uh, the EEV blog, and look for contextual electronics coming soon. That's right. Yeah. All right. Thank you for your time. Thanks. So my name is Jeremy. Um, I'm currently living in San Francisco. I'm an electrical engineer. I just finished my undergraduate and master's degree at Cornell University in New York. Um, right now I'm working at Google X as a hardware engineer on the Glass project. Uh, uh, but I also do a lot of independent consulting. I make videos, I just wrote a book. So your book was called Exploring Arduino. Yes, that's right. It just came out uh, about two months ago now. Did you enjoy writing it or were there certain challenges you didn't expect? With a technical book, writing it is just such a small part of the struggle. That's like 30% of the work because then you have to make diagrams and you have to write all the programs, you have to test everything you show in the book and you have to get the figure permissions and the editing. And there's a lot, there's a lot more that goes into it than I initially anticipated, but I'm still glad I did it and people have been liking it, so that's good. Who would you say your book is for? Is it for people that are just getting into electronics or you know, is there more advanced stuff? Basically what I did was it starts off pretty simple assuming no prior knowledge of electronics or programming. It's helpful to have a little bit, um, but if you don't, you can kind of start at the beginning of the book and understand what's going on. Um, dispersed throughout the book are kind of like excerpts and tidbits that go into much more technical detail than you need to understand what the how to build the project, but they help you understand what's going on in the background. Can you give us an example of uh, a cool project that the book shows us how to do? Some of the cool ones uh, towards the end of the book involve uh, some monitoring systems for your room. So one of them is using the Arduino, Arduino Leonardo, which can emulate a keyboard uh, to be able to lock your computer when you turn the lights off and leave your room. Very simple, but actually a pretty useful project. 
Another one is a room entry monitoring system. So you kind of uh, tape some infrared distance sensors next to your door. Uh, you set up the Arduino, you use an SD card to log information, uh, and you track information about the infrared receiver and use that to discern when people are entering or exiting your room. What would you say is the coolest Arduino project you've seen anyone ever do? More recently, I've seen one or two very impressive um, Iron Man costumes that use multiple Arduinos to control the face mask lifting up and the blaster on the head and accelerometers to control all kinds of things with Arduinos. Now you're with Google Glass. I'm sure there's not a whole lot you can tell us. What I can say is I'm a hardware engineer there. Uh, I'm doing electrical design for Glass. Um, that's as much as I can say about what I'm doing. I guess I seem to be drawn to these big uh, engineering trends uh, where the industry is changing. So I spent two years working at MakerBot and I designed electronics for the 3D printers. Oh, that's right. Printers. You did the board inside yeah. of the replicator. And I worked on the digitizer too, which is start shipping this week. So I was on like the 3D printing bandwagon for a while. And now I think one of the other really big things that's going to make a splash in the next few years is going to be wearable electronics. There have been some really interesting videos of doctors uh, using it in mock surgery to get information. Uh, immediately pass them in a way where they don't have to look away from the patient. I think there's a lot of potential also for the disabled. Yesterday, for example, um, uh, my bike had a disagreement with the sidewalk and now my hand's in a splint. Oh no! Uh, <laughs> so, um, and so at first I was very bummed out and then I was like, oh, this is gonna be a very excellent opportunity for me to make a lot of use of glass because we're gonna have tremendous trouble, trouble typing. How far away do you think we are from like, you know, when you're 15 years old and you need glasses, you just like, just take them out and put in replacements, you know, like, like Google Glass eyeballs. I mean, that's gonna happen someday, right? I think one of the biggest hurdles is not gonna be the technology, it's going to be people's willingness to use it. Cool, well, uh, thank you for your time today, Jeremy. It was great having you on the show. Yeah, absolutely, happy to do it. We'd like to thank all of our guests for taking the time to appear on our show. In our next episode, we're going to be building a computerized hot glue gun that will hopefully fix many of the problems with modern hot glue guns. We'll see you then. That is a good question. You are a great interview, Mr. Heckendorf. What Tony Stark has in Iron Man, I would buy that in a second if I could just sit down and tell my computer, you know, load up these three programs, get this ready, bring this on the screen. There's really no reason we can't have that right now. And you know, that's where yeah. I would love to see the technology because for me, it would make it more productive. <laughs> good, great. All right. <laughs> Super. Yeah, that's a good, that's a much better way to say it. <laughs> the Ben Heck Show is brought to you by Element 14, the electronic design community and online store built for engineers and hobbyists alike. Join now and browse the store at element14.com. <laughs>